Hi, my name is Corey Hart. I'm an education specialist with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. And this is season four, episode two of the Scat and Tracks program. This week, we are going to be talking all about the Eastern Coyote, which can actually be found statewide across Vermont. Uh, but up until the 1940s, you would not have encountered the coyote in Vermont. So the Eastern coyote arrived in Vermont sometime around the 1940s, and they migrated east from the Mississippi. On their way to Vermont, they actually bred with wolves in Canada and then worked their way back down into Vermont. And that resulted in the coyote population that we're having today and being slightly larger than the coyotes uh, in the western half of the country. So even though the coyote was not here a hundred years ago, we don't consider them an invasive species. Uh, we instead consider them a naturalized species, meaning they kind of moved up into an area and they filled an important role. Other great examples will be brown trout, as well as rainbow trout. So a lot of folks don't realize that, uh, but brown and rainbow trout were not, or are not native to Vermont, but they are now naturalized, meaning they can be found across the state and we manage for them. So now it's time to talk a little bit about identification of the Eastern Coyote. So I have in my hands right here, a Eastern Coyote pelt. And you see that it is actually quite long. When we're identifying the Eastern Coyote, and you'll see a picture of a full body coyote right now up on the screen right there. When we're identifying them, it's important to remember that they are larger than their Western ancestors, uh, but they're also not wolves. So they did breed with wolves on their way, way over, but they are their own individual species. So they are still smaller than, than wolves. The main thing I'm looking at with them is coloration. So they're often be gray in color, but you can see this one right here has some reddish color to it. They're not always consistent, so it's not gonna be a perfect, then not all of them are gonna look exactly the same as with a lot of species out there. Uh, they have a nice long bushy tail, typically tipped with a black tip on the end of it. So a couple other key characteristics that we're looking for when we're identifying the Eastern Coyote is they have a really slender face as well as pointy ears. Oftentimes, as well as with any species, they can be easily misidentified. Uh, so what they often get mixed up with is uh, red fox, as well as gray fox. People often will see them at a distance and misidentify, but an easy way to, to tell them apart is not only in their coloration, but also in size. So the coyotes that we have in Vermont are typically anywhere from 30 to 50 pounds. So 50 pounds would be a really large coyote. And just to give you an idea, that would be about the size of a Border Collie or a Lab. So if you have a dog at home, it kind of gives you a, a good imagery of what that would actually, what that, how tall that coyote would actually stand. So if you see a smaller, smaller critter out there, it's probably going to be a red fox or a gray fox. Well, what great habitat we have right here for the Eastern Coyote this time of year. So coyotes are generalists, meaning that they're highly adaptable and they do really well in a wide range of different environments. So whether it's a suburban setting or a more rural setting, they really thrive in different areas. Where we're standing right here is actually great habitat for coyotes this time of year. So during the summer and fall, it's really common to find a lot of sign of coyotes in large open areas. And that's primarily due to the species that they're hunting during that time of year. As, part, as well as the region that they're in. So in Vermont, especially in the Champaign, or Champlain Valley area, uh, open fields, areas like this meadow that we're in right now during the summer and fall uh, is we're gonna have most of my success finding signs of coyotes. During the rest of the year, they're gonna be more in the hardwoods and softwood environment as what they're feeding on changes at that time of the year. Coyotes are omnivores, meaning that they eat both plants and animals. So they eat a wide range of things. If you think of, we just talked a little bit about habitat and where they're really highly adaptable. Well, they're highly adaptable in what they eat as well. So given the, the time of the year, they might be eating apples, or perhaps they're going after rodents, rabbits, Snowshoe hare in, in northern Vermont. Their diets are wide ranging across the state. During periods of deep snow or early spring, 
Uh, it is common for coyotes to occasionally harvest uh, a deer or, or fawn for that matter, but there are studies out there that actually show that it does not have an effect on the population. Uh, it is incredibly important that we have coyotes on our landscape. And the main reason for that is due to that gap in predation. So they help to keep the populations in check and keep us keep a nice, healthy ecosystem. And that goes right back to years ago when we used to have wolves on the landscape in Vermont and they helped to keep everything in check. When we lost wolves, we lost that really important part of the ecosystem. Now that coyotes have come and come into Vermont, they've naturalized, they've helped to fill that gap. And it is an incredibly important part of the ecosystem. Spend enough time in Vermont and you might hear that people think poorly of coyotes. That's not true. Coyotes are really important across the landscape, but there are some groups out there that do wish to eliminate coyotes uh, from the landscape. And that is completely against modern wildlife management. Vermont's coyote population is healthy and thriving. And that is primarily due to the great habitat that we have here in Vermont. The coyotes that we have in Vermont are really cautious around humans and really wary. And that is incredibly important. Uh, due to other areas across the country, such as areas in California or Massachusetts, where there isn't negative reinforcement, we've been seeing coyotes have bad behavior problems, such as being in too close to suburban areas or causing other issues. Uh, so it's really important in Vermont for a coyote to remain cautious and wary of humans. Mating season for the eastern coyote begins in February. And if you spend a lot of time outdoors that time of year, you might notice increasing number of coyote howls. And that's because they're mating at that time of year, so they're a lot more active. Uh, the female coyote is pregnant for about nine weeks and gives birth in April or May. And they're going to den up in either an old woodchuck den or fox den that they hollow out a little bit more. Or they might also choose areas like crevices or under logs to be their den. The, once the pups are born, the male coyote and the female coyote actually work together. And the male coyote spends most of their time actually hunting and bringing back food to the den. So the pups are really self-reliant, or really reliant on the adults at that stage. They can't leave the den. But at that same note, the coyotes are very cautious as they approach the den. So it's really common that if there's a disturbance near the den, for whatever reason, the male and female coyotes will actually move the pups to another location and change that den site. So coyotes, when they mate, they typically mate at two years of age and they may actually mate for life. After they've mated and they've reproduced, then those coyote pups are completely dependent on the adults to teach them all about hunting. And that's the same case with a lot of animals. In January, as the breeding season has approached, most young coyotes have finished learning and they're now ready to move off on their own and find their own territory. It can take them a long time to find a territory though that is not occupied by another family group. During the late winter of their first year, they may take a mate, but they won't breed until the following winter. Coyote mortality, meaning deaths, during their first years is extremely high. And that's due to a wide variety of factors, such as diseases and parasites. There's several studies out there that show that for young coyotes, their mortality rate is around 50 to 68%. That number decreases though as they reach one year of maturity. So during that first year, their survival rate is less than 50%. So now we're to the point of the segment where we're gonna talk about the signs of the coyote that we might encounter when we're out there uh, with our class. So we're gonna see primarily three different signs of coyotes. Or correction, you will see two signs of coyotes. You might hear the third. Uh, so primarily the three signs that we're looking for when we're out there is you're going to see tracks, scat, as well as, if we listen, we might hear coyotes. During the daytime it's not as common. Uh, it's more often that we'll hear them right around dusk or in the evening hours as we're going to hear them, their barks, their howls, or their yips. So I wouldn't expect you to hear them when you're out there with your school, but it is possible for you to hear them in the distance as they're communicating with other family groups. 
or with their family group as well. So oftentimes they'll communicate to tell uh, another family group that that's their territory. Uh, but if they're off hunting, they'll communicate with their family group to locate the others in the group. So moving on to tracks and looking for that sign that I'm going to see either in the snow or in the mud or, or, or wherever of coyotes, the main thing I'm looking for is, as with any critter, uh, first we're going to try to narrow it down. So are they a, a walker, a bounder, a hopper, or a waddler? Well, coyotes are a walker or trotter, meaning they're going one foot after the other foot fairly quick. I actually just saw a coyote the other day and I only saw it for maybe 10 seconds. It was, it was there and then it was gone because it was moving on and it was hunting through that area and, and looking for food. Uh, so when I'm looking at their tracks, the main thing I'm looking at is you have a really defined pad right in the back and then you have four toes that come off and all four paws are going to be identical. So, and that is different than the opossum that we talked about last week, where the front and rear paws were completely different. So all four are gonna be the same. And on these toes, the four toes that come off, you're gonna have claws that come down in the front that are gonna be very evident. You might not always see the claws coming down, depending on what type of surface. So if it's mud or just hard dirt, you might not get that perfect track right there. What will allow you to narrow it down is you can kind of backtrack and look through and find other sign or find other tracks to try to narrow it down. The other thing that also will allow you to narrow it down that it's a coyote is scat. And on our walk here, we saw a lot of scat today, and it was all coyote scat. I actually have some coyote scat right here with me. And this coyote scat, you might look at it right now and say, wow, that looks a lot like my dog scat that I have at home. And you're completely correct. It does look very similar. But there's some things that we can tell apart right away. Oftentimes with coyote scat, we're gonna see evidence of what they ate previously. So I might see out evidence of bones. I could see evidence of fur, feathers, whatever it is that that coyote has eaten earlier, we're gonna see that in its scat. And that right there allows me to tell you that it was not a domesticated dog. That's a really easy giveaway. Uh, you also can focus on the area that you're in as well. So are you a long way away from houses? Where, where are you walking uh, with the scat is that you found? Now we're to the point in the segment that you probably have been looking forward to, and that's gonna be that nature hike that you're gonna take with your class. So, so far we've talked a little bit about habitat, we've talked about identification, we've covered management, we covered signs that we're gonna encounter when we're out there. So the tracks, the scat, we might hear some howls or barking or yipping of the coyotes as they're communicating. Uh, but now it's time to actually get out there and go out on that walk. So remember the type of habitat that you're looking for it's going to vary a little bit on the time of year. So if you're out there in the fall or the summer, you're going to want to focus more in open areas. Areas where there's fields or meadows. If you're looking uh, during the winter months or the spring, you're going to want to focus more in areas where you have upland habitat, meaning uh, there's a lot of uh, woods such as oaks, maples, as well as some softwoods and areas like that as well. Uh, so really focus on your habitat selection based on the time of year that you're out there searching. And get out there and have some fun. Don't forget to bring your track cards with you. Next week we are going to be highlighting the short-tailed weasel, also known as an ermine.